service and those that are viewing online thank you for for uh, watching today if you're visiting uh, we especially want to uh, greet you today and glad that you're here to share in our worship time together we want to our, our goal today is uh, to get these songs in our heart and our mind and when we leave here today that we're worshiping that we're, we're praising him now but we praise him when we leave and of course uh, to be taught and learn from the Word of God, from our pastor, that uh, we greatly appreciate. He's a very religious individual, and that's what we, that's what we love about him. Okay. Let's uh, let's continue in worship. You're worthy of my praise. Started that thing wrong. Again, Jimmy. Again. Jimmy. I got it. Dun. There it is. Sorry, y'all. Worship the king, all glorious above. Gratefully sing his wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of Grace, his robe is alive and can be 
be seated. It is indeed our duty and privilege to worship the matchless king. Our scripture reading this morning is from 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 15 to 23. Then Samuel arose and went up from Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people who were present with him, about 600 men. Now Saul and his son Jonathan and the people who were present with him were staying in Geba of Benjamin while the Philistines camped at Michmash. And the raiders came from the camp of the Philistines in three companies. One company tor- turned towards Ophrah to the land of Shual. And another company turned towards Beth Horam. And another company turned toward the border which overlooks the valley of Zeboim toward the wilderness. Now, no blacksmith could be found in all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, otherwise the Hebrews will make swords or spears. So all Israel went down to the Philistines, each to sharpen his plowshare, his mattock, his axe, and his hoe. The charge was two-thirds of a shekel for the plowshares, the mattocks, the forts, and the axes, and to fix the hoes. So it came about on the day of battle that neither sword nor spear was found in the hands of any of the people who were with Saul and Jonathan, but they were found with Saul and his son Jonathan. And the garrison of the Philistines went out to the pass of Michmash. May God add his richest blessing to the reading of his holy word. It is now time for our virtual offering. We have envelopes in the pews if you're here that look like this. You have several options. You can drop these in the uh, offering plates in the back. I think there's a box back there too. If you're online, there's a drop down menu that looks a lot like this and you can choose among general fund, missions, capital improvements, and I think benevolence. The principle is, Jesus told us this principle. He didn't make it up. It's just the way the Almighty God created us. That where our treasure is, there our hearts will be also. So God allows us to put our hearts towards Mountain View Church, our hearts toward the community through benevolence, our hearts into kingdom work throughout the world through your faith promise. And so let's ask God's blessing on your gifts today. Thank you, Lord, so much that you allow us, you encourage us to be a part of your kingdom work. We know that as we give of our treasure, our hearts will follow, and we know that you have the hearts of the people here. We've seen their treasure being given time and time again. So bless these hearts, bless these people, we pray, as you have promised to. And in every way, you've promised that by your divine nature, you'll give us everything that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. We thank you for that, and we pray that that would be real in our lives, in the lives of all the people here today. In Christ's name, amen. My 
Let's uh, look to the Lord together. Father, we are needy people. We need your grace every moment. We're desperate people. We need your power and your strength. For without it, we are really nothing in anything we attempt to do. And Father, right now we need you to give us spiritual ears and eyes to hear from you what you would have us know, what you would have us to um, incarnate into our own lives. And uh, Father, I pray for those who are here and who perhaps are listening and they have uh, physical problems and needs. And Lord, we pray that you would encourage them, that you put your arms around them comfort them. May they feel your presence today in a very special way. And Lord, pray for healing for for them. That be within your divine plan. We know that it's nothing for you to heal anyone. And so, Lord, we're asking that for many of your children who are are members and friends of Mountain View Church. And now, Father, as we open your word, we pray that you would teach us and guide us. And uh, Lord, keep, help us uh, to, to, to not uh, see this as just another Sunday service in which we kind of go through the motions and we tune out and we um, don't hear what you have to say to us. It's not by accident that each person is here today, but by divine providence. And so we, Lord, 
I look forward to seeing what you're going to do today. In your son's name we pray, amen. I do, I do want to say to those who are watching at home, I mean, I know that some are still staying at home and are watching, and I understand that and concerns that you have, but I want to say that there's still plenty of room here to spread out, uh, and I know some who are here today who have underlying health issues, and yet they're here, and so and if you want to come and you want to uh, put on a mask, that's fine. We welcome you. We accept everyone. And so I uh, just want to encourage you. Uh, Pete used to do that quite a bit, and so Pete's been retired and moved away, and so I felt like I needed to say that. One thing I don't say enough is, our, our, is talk about our vision purpose, our, our purpose, our vision, how you statement. And it's on the back of your bulletin. If you look at it, flip your bulletin over to the back, it's there, and it says, uh, to deploy Christians into the world with great commandment hearts, great commission lifestyles. That's what that's talking about when you see that that big sign up, up uh, let me get this adjusted here, get it over, get my ear back in place. Um, you see that great commandment hearts, and the great commandment heart is to love God with all your heart, everything within you. And then the second part of that is a great commission lifestyle. A great commission lifestyle is a lifestyle that desires to make disciples, that desires to spread the gospel, to communicate the gospel, and so uh, how do we do that? And we don't say this enough, but what we do here, part of this whole disciple-making process begins right here on Sunday morning. Some people think that disciple-making is, is something you do in a program uh, that says disciple-making. Uh, no, if, if you're teaching the Word of God, now if you're giving a, a candy out on Sunday morning, it's different. But if, if you're preaching and teaching verse by verse, uh, as the Old Testament says, line upon line, uh, if you're doing that, this discipleship begins right here. You're being discipled. Another way we do discipleship, of course, is with uh, small groups, and, and, and we're going to be kicking those off very soon here in the ABFs. On a Sunday morning, we're going to bring everybody together uh, on one giant ABF uh, uh, program or uh, class, and we're going to watch a video series entitled How We Got the Bible. One of the questions I've had asked me a number of times over the recent years is, what determines what book got into the Bible and what book got you know, omitted? Well, this video series will help you understand that as well. Another way we do dis disciple making too, though, is, is with children. And I believe, and I've seen every, just about every program there is for children, and I believe that Awana is the greatest disciple making program for children that you can find. And not only that, children have a great time. They just have a fun time. They, they, they want to come back. And so we're going to be kicking that off in just a couple of weeks, uh, the 22nd. And uh, we need you to, we're going to have brochures next week. We're going to need you to help us get that, get the word out. Maybe you feel awkward about sh telling your neighbor, hey, let me try to explain to you Juana. Well, here, we'll give you a brochure that you can use and perhaps as kind of a, uh, something you can give to them and perhaps explain it as you give it to them. So in any event, uh, several things kicking off, N new series coming up, one I'm excited about, Israel and prophecy. Uh, there's often the questions about, you know, what is God's view about Israel? There are many people today who, in our churches, sadly, uh, with reform and covenant theology, and I, and I don't, I have brothers in, who, I, whom I love who are covenant and reformed theologians, uh, but part of the problem of many, some of that teaching is that they believe that the church has replaced Israel. Well, has the church replaced Israel? We're going to answer that question uh, in this series as well as the several other questions. So I'm looking forward to that as well. Well, um, football is right around the corner, right? The professional teams have, have uh, they've come together. They've, they're there at their camps. I think this coming weekend, uh, college teams will be meeting. And um, when it comes to football, whether it's basketball or baseball, any good coach will tell you, in order to really win, you have to have a good defense. You've got to have a good defense. Uh, you've got to stop the other team from scoring. If you score a lot of points, and yet the other team scores more points than you, then you've got a problem. You don't have a defense. And so many coaches will say you've you got to have a, a good defense. In fact, uh, I went to a, what we would call a high school basketball school. We, we had great teams. 
and, uh, and we scored a lot of points. We were very good at fast break, things of that nature. But one of the things, mottos that, that the coach put on the wall was, he, he said, it went like this, on nights that your offense is not there, your defense will carry you. Uh, that's a great point. And, and so you got to have a good defense. Well, in the Christian life, you got to have a good defense. Uh, a good defense is knowing the spiritual disciplines that you need to have to kind of, that will keep you out of sin, keep you out of the temptations that, that will lure you into sin. Keep, you need to have discernment on how to deflect uh, Satan's lies that he throws at you. But for some Christians, all they do, in my view, is they play defense. Uh, the Christian life to them is more about what they don't do than about what they do for God. Well, any good team that has a good defense also has to have an offense, a good offense. Uh, you have to be able to move the ball down the field to score the touchdown. You've got to be able to take the basketball and put it in the basket. You get, if, but when it comes to baseball, you've got to be able to hit the ball and get men on base and, and bring them home. You've got to have a good offense. Well, God doesn't call us just to have a good defense. And then we, I don't want to diminish the importance of having spiritual disciplines. Uh, we need to have that. But we also need to have a good offense. What do I mean by that? I mean that we need to take the initiative to do great things for God, to do significant things for God. God wants you to have that offense. That you're in your mind, you're thinking, what can I do for God that's going to please him and satisfy him? Now, when I mention great things for God, I know that some of us are going to have in our mind these grandiose ideas of perhaps winning thousand, a thousand people to Christ or, or preaching before hundreds of people or teaching a Bible class before many, many people. And those are all great and good. But that's, let me help you temper that word uh, great, just a bit. You're doing, you can do something great when you are just living out a life of integrity in the world. When what you say and what you do match. When you claim that you're a Christian and you live out that, it is seen in how you're, what, what comes from your lips Nowadays, we can say what comes from the, our typewriter, uh, how we respond when we are tempted to uh, compromise in our lives. Um, this week, one of our leaders was telling me that he said he got this uh, thing, uh, email, I guess it was, that says, we need to have your signature today on this document. He said, well, he told me, he said, it would take me two hours to review that document. I really didn't have that much time. And they said, we got to have it today. He said, well, I'm sorry. I can't do that. And there was a person who, the pressure was to compromise and to say, give in, cave in. And, but he said, no, I'm not going to do that. And as it turned out, God worked it all out. It was amazing how God worked it out. Uh, doing great things for God is speaking our faith when we're tempted to uh, uh, acquiesce to the intimidation of other people around us, especially the unbelieving world. And doing great things for God is also serving him. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we had a lot of people here during BBS who were doing great things for God. They were just being there as a servant saying, God, I want to make a difference. And they were making a difference in lives of young people that we'll never know completely what type of difference they made. God wants, we need to understand, and, and uh, when it comes to a great commandment of heart, that a great commandment of heart and a great commission lifestyle, like doing great things for God, they go hand in hand. First Samuel chapter 12, verse 20, we looked at this a few weeks ago. Samuel said to the people, do not fear, you have committed all this evil, yet do not turn aside. Remember, what was the evil? They wanted a king. They said, we want a king. Okay, God says, I'll give you a king. And God, in spite of that, God said, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to reject you. I'm not going to abandon you. I'll give you the king. And he said, went on to say, if you do not turn aside from, the, from following, following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. 
He was saying, I, I will still be with you. In spite of the fact that you're settling for my, not my directive will, not my plan A, but for my plan B. Nonetheless, I'm, at this case, in this case, I'm going to allow you, I'm, I'm going to be with you, but you've got to follow me. You've got to serve me. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12 and 13, another passage that really speaks to a great commandment heart. It says, now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and love him, and to, say it with me, serve him, serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. So we're called to serve him. We're called to do great things, and doing great things is serving him. And it's not just, but it's not just doing things. It's living a life that is distinctly and except, exceptionally different. Now, let's turn. If we're going to talk about uh, doing great things for God, then how do we, what's the prerequisite for doing that? Well, our passage today in, in uh, 1 Samuel 13 and 14 uh, will give us some guidelines as to how we do that. So let's turn to 1 Samuel 13 and answer that question. What are the prerequisites for doing something great for God? Now, 1 Samuel 13. Now, last week we looked at the first part of the chapter, and what, we, what did we see? We, we saw that God orders, he plans uh, divine pop quizzes. That is, he designs tests, plans tests for each of us. Why? Because he wants to, number one, he wants to know the character of our faith, the, the strength of our faith. He wants to, but also by testing us, we are adding strength to our muscles, we might say, to our faith. But also, as we pointed out, all of those tests that we receive or that we go through, and by the way, when we say tests, we're not talking about when we blow it and we say, oh, I'm going through difficult times. No, that's, that's on us, but I'm talking about there are times I know Christians today really don't like to hear this, and many will not even preach it, but there are times that God will put a test in the front of us to see how we are going to re respond and to strengthen us. But also, all of those, in terms of their uh, value together, kind of like at the, the test at the end of a semester, they're all designed to determine what your placement will be in the millennium, and there will be a millennium, not to mention not to mention uh, the rewards that we will receive at the um, uh, marriage feast of the Lamb. Now, a portion of the passage that was read has to do with the fact that after Samuel gave Saul that blistering condemnation. What was it? You remember what happened with Saul? Well, Saul, Samuel said, look, you are to wait for me. Before you go to battle, you are to wait for me. Wait seven days. I'll come down. I'll tell you what God says to do. Well, Saul waited those seven days. Samuel was late. Samuel didn't come at the, at the end of seven days. And so Saul couldn't wait. Great principle there we saw last week on waiting on God. God calls upon us to wait upon him. And so Sam, uh, Saul took things into his own hands. And, uh, and, and so Samuel really just blistered him. And he said, you're done. He said, you're done. God is putting you on the shelf, and God is looking for a man who has a heart that's hot after him. That would be David. And he says, but he's done with you, Saul, so, as far as the king. Now, the change, changing of the guard came years later, but nonetheless, God said, you're done, man. Well, the rest of the chapter really chronicles how the Israelites were nowhere close to having the armament that the Philistines had. The Israelites had no swords. In fact, some scholars would say that the, the, the end of what was read today really was the, uh, a parenthetical statement uh, talking about, again, how Israel compared to the Philistines when it came to their weapons. Uh, the Philistines were known for their technology when it came to making such great uh, weapons, particularly, particularly in the area of iron and metal. Uh, at, at least until the time of David, they were so far superior to the Israelites. 
In fact, this section tells us that the Israelites had to go to the Philistines in order to get their farming tools sharpened. And the, the indication is from history as well as from the text that uh, the Philistines kind of kept the Israelites kind of at bay when it came to their increasing or learning the skill of, of making these type of weapons. But the text says that there were no swords or spears that the Israelites had, but these people had, the Philistines had plenty. And not only that, but they, they had a great large group of, of soldiers and weapons. You, all you have to do is go back to chapter 12 verse 5 and it says now the Philistines assembled to fight with Israel 30,000 chariots. Now let me just pause again. Now we know that the, the scriptures in their original manuscript are, are, are inspired of God. We don't have the original manuscript but the original manuscript that, that God spoke to uh, he, he, he spoke to the, his, his, his prophets and they wrote down, those were called the original manuscripts. Now, we don't have the original manuscripts, but we have copies of copies, and sometimes, many times, copies of copies of copies. In the process, at times, letters faded, words faded. Sometimes a copyist would make a mistake or would be somewhat uh, negligent in what he did in his copying. And so words or letters would fall off. And so I say all that to say this. And when you look at chapter 12, verse 5, it says, Now the Philistines assembled to fight with Israel 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen. There are many scholars who believe that it's probably 3,000 chariots. And, and here's why. The chariots normally had two chariot riders, two soldiers that would ride a chariot. So more than likely it was 3,000 chariots with 6,000 soldiers. Now, on top of that, it goes on to say that uh, the people like the sand, which is on the seashore, in abundance. So, and, and these people have encamped at Michmash. Now, what's happened here? Okay, what's happened is that uh, in last week, as we saw, uh, the Philistines took over the city known as Geba. Geba was a Levitical city. Again, the Levites were given cities, not land, but they were given cities to have. And of course, the Levites would be no match for a garrison from the Philistines. And so the Philistines and the garrison came in, took over that city. Well, Jonathan, who was a great warrior and a man of God, took it back. And so here we are today, and uh, the Philistines are hot. They're livid. The text says they, they loathe the Israelites, I mean, they are madder than a hornet. And they're ready, they're at Micmac, Micmash, waiting to attack. And so in chapter 14, verse 1, something unexpected happens. It says, Now the day came that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who was carrying his armor, Come and let us cross over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he did not tell his father. His father obviously saw, would say, what are you doing? You're not going over there. Just sit down. So he didn't, he didn't tell his father. Now, remember verse 5 back in chapter 12. What would cause someone like Saul, I'm a Samuel I should say, to step out against all odds, he's just going with his armor, the guy who carries his armor, and that's it. What would cause him to do such thing? You know, we all know about the story of David and Goliath, right? I mean, everybody, every, ask the, the, the unbeliever on the street, he's heard of the story of David and Goliath, right? How often do we speak of this particular instance? when Jonathan goes up against all these men, and yet he does. So, what's a prerequisite? What are they? Well, here's the first. I must, divine, I must have divinely inspired courage. I must have a divinely inspired courage that makes me almost immune to intimidation. Jonathan is one who really gives us a contrast 
to Saul. Now, we're, this series is about Saul and his life as a contrast to, to, to Samuel and vice versa. Here, though, we have a Jonathan who is a godly man, a great warrior, and he gives us a contrast to Saul again. Saul was this very insecure man, as we notice, uh, as we've noted already, who was easily intimidated. Uh, as we get into chapter 14, we'll read that he's sitting under a tree. He's got his men there with him. He's got the ephod, the, the Urim and Thummim there to determine the will of God, but he's not going anywhere. He's, he's intimidated. Now, Jonathan, like Samuel, I would suggest to you, was one not to be intimidated. And you have to ask the question, why? Because his heart was true to God. It was close to God. And because of that, he was set free to go on the offensive, to do something great for God. Keep that in mind. There's something great here. There's something very significant here. How many times have we been more like Saul than we are like Jonathan, when it comes to going on the offensive and doing something significant for God, when it comes to speaking up for God at work, speaking up for Christ, we become intimidated. Even say we, you want to, we, sometimes Christians want to have a Bible study at their work, but they think, well, if I have a Bible study, if I'm a part of that or if I lead that, then uh, that's going to you know, stereotype me and I'm going to be this re viewed as a, this religious hick or whatever it is. And so I'm going to be rejected and people are going to, my boss is going to know about it and he's not going to see me in a favorable light and he's not going to give me a promotion and on and on and on. I'm going to lose my job and if I'm going to lose my job and then before long I'm going to starve to death and after that I'm going to die and so on and on and on. Or at a lunch time break in the break room and the conversation begins to go south and people begin to pontificate over what they think is right. And, we, and you know it's not what God wants. The temptation there and the intimidation is keep quiet. Instead of saying, you know, I, I, you don't have to be abrasive. Instead, but you could say, I, I, I just don't see it that way. I believe in the God of the Bible and the Bible tells me this, if I understand it correctly, in, in a spirit of meekness. And yet we're afraid to do that. But Jonathan may have had some of the same fears I suppose. I mean, no one would blame him, right? Humanly speaking. Interesting enough, one of the commentators, <laughs> one of the commentators uh, on this particular passage, an old one, uh, he wrote this. This is really interesting. He said, after all, if Jonathan failed, he could only lose his life. <laughs> Uh, most of us would say, only? I mean, that's kind of a big deal. What do you mean, only? But when we actually think about it, it makes great sense. Isn't that what our Lord said? Hold your place and flip back to, to Luke chapter 20, uh, Luke 12, I should say. Luke 12, beginning in verse 4, he says, I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who, who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. So, what's the worst thing that can happen to you? Our Lord says. Well, you can be killed. But think about it. Today, you're probably not going to be killed for standing for your faith. You're probably not going to die. Now, there may come a day when you, you may, and there are others in other countries that will die because of their faith. We've heard many stories from missionaries telling us about that. But when we look at those in the Bible that were encouraged not to fear, not to be intimidated, not to run, not to faint, not to have a, 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 
an anxious met meltdown, uh, they were facing death. We don't usually face that. Did you know that most of our Lord's disciples, and if you've been here on Easter, you've heard me say this. Did you know that most of the Lord's disciples, and I'm not talking about just the 12 apostles or 11 apostles, but most of the Lord's disciples died a martyr's death. All but one, the beloved disciple John. And he was thrown into a vat of oil and somehow survived and banished to the island of Patmos. But all the rest died a martyr's death. Never at any point did they recant. Peter was, at his own request, was crucified upside down. Many were beheaded. We don't face that. And yet we're intimidated. I'm a, I'm, I'm, I thought as I was reading this this week and studying this, I thought about that great story in Numbers 13. In Numbers 13 where the, the, the witnesses, the spies, go out into the land. They're sent into the land of Canaan. The, the, they are to spy out the land. God has given the, the Hebrew people the land of Canaan. Oh, they, they were to go in to spy out the land. And you know, there was a majority report, and there was a minority report. The majority report said, there are giants in the land. We can't do this. We're going to die. But there was a minority report made up of two guys, Joshua and Caleb. I like those names. Joshua and Caleb came back, and Caleb said, we can do this. God has given us this. And in Numbers 13, verse 30, it says, Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, We should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we will surely overcome it. Caleb, how could he, how could he say that? Because he was like Jonathan. Jonathan. Jonathan was like Caleb. Do you know what the name Caleb means? The name Caleb means whole heart. His heart was totally given to the Lord. And because of that, he feared none other but God himself. And Jonathan had a pretty good hunch that God was going to deliver them by defeating the Philistines. Listen, we marvel at David for taking out the big guy of the Philistines. We, we need to marvel at Jonathan in this passage. Because what happens? I mean, man, we see he just takes over. Yeah. In fact, let me before I had, I had a passage I wanted to look at before we we move on to that. Uh, in, it's in Acts chapter twenty one. Acts twenty one, verses ten, beginning of verse ten. This is uh, uh, Paul. He's on his third missionary journey. He's heading to Jerusalem, taking an offering, and everybody's telling him, "Don't go there. Don't go there." In fact. Uh, when he reaches Philip's house in Caesarea, uh, there is a, a, a sign sent from the Holy Spirit. Let's pick it up in Acts 21, verse 10. It says, As we were staying there for some days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, This is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Verse 12, when we had heard this, we as well as the local residents began begging him not to go up to Jerusalem. Now watch Paul's response. Paul answered, what are you doing weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord. Paul said, I'm ready. I'm ready to be thrown into jail and if need be, be killed for the cause of Christ. Did you know that the ancient martyrs, as they would reference their, no doubt, martyrdom, that one day they knew they were going to die, you know what they would always say? They, they referred to it as their graduation as their graduation. Huh. They saw it coming. They said, we're, we're just going to graduate. So the next time we're tempted to be intimidated 
are made afraid of people. Friends, co-workers, neighbors, whomever. Remember that God has called you to do things differently, to do great things for him. And that means standing for him. Yes, there may be some consequences to you. You may have be rejected. You may be, people may talk about you and criticize you. But that's a small amount compared to what we see in the Bible. You ever go into those, uh, was it post-Thanksgiving sales or uh, Christmas sales when everybody's at the door, they keep the doors closed, and at a certain time they're going to let you in, either 6 o'clock in the morning or 2 o'clock in the morning or whenever. But everybody's there. Everybody's, people get out of bed. They go to there, and, and they're waiting. And they can't wait. When doors open, people run over at people. They fight over stuff. Uh, why do they want to do that? Because they want items cheaply. They don't want to pay a lot for their items that they really want. I've thought about that. And I've thought about Christians a lot like that. They show up when God is on sale. As long as he comes at a reduced price with low expectations, we'll, we'll shop there. We'll come to church when nothing is expected. But the moment he comes at full price, the parking lot is empty. First, we must have a divinely inspired courage if I am going to do something, if we're going to do something great for God. Now, in chapter 14, back in 1 Samuel, let's pick it up in verse 2. Saul was staying in, in, in the outskirts of Gibeah under the pomegranate tree, which is at Migron. And the people who were with him were about 600 men. And Ahijah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the priest of the Lord at Shiloh, was wearing an ephod. And the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Between the passes by which Jonathan sought to cross over to the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp crag or rock on the one side and a sharp crag or rock on the other. And the name of the one was Moaz, and the name of the other was Sinai. In the one crag rose a rock rose on the north opposite Michmash, and the other on the south opposite Giva. Now, there's some background here. As we watch this, Saul has a priest he has a priest who has the ephod. Now, what's an ephod? An ephod was this garment, beautiful, colorful garment, that first that the high priest would wear. And then he would have this breastplate. And on that breastplate, there would be different, uh, there would be precious jewels. And it, through that breastplate, oftentimes the Hebrew people would ascertain the will of God. God would speak through that breastplate. So, so that's kind of the background. But so the, the, here's the thing. And again, it kind of gives a contrast between Saul and Jonathan. Saul had all of this. He had the will of God. Right? All he had to do is, is seek that out. But Saul's not doing anything. But in verse 6, what we see is a true character of, of Jonathan. Watch this. Then Jonathan said to the young man who was carrying his armor, Come and let us cross over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. Perhaps, now watch this phrase. You might even want to underline, underline it. Perhaps the Lord will work for us, for the Lord is not restrained to save by many or by few. Huh. Here, the armor bearer of Jonathan, as they're going up for, to face these people, he says, hey, uh, uh, Jonathan, have you noticed? There are only two of us. Uh, what are we going to do? Watch what John, did you see what Jonathan said? He says, but the Lord, he said, I, you can just kind of see him. He said, well, I know that. But he said, the Lord can help a few soldiers or he can help many, so a whole army. He's not confined or limited to the size of an army. Now, we know in history that often the size of armies will determine who wins. That's not true in God's economy. You've got to understand, again, God sees things differently. God turns everything upside down. It doesn't matter whether you have two 
Remember the story of Gideon? No, it doesn't matter. That's faith. Jonathan was going to go into this with total dependence on God. If you're ever going to accomplish anything great for God, not only do you need to have a divinely inspired courage, but you also must depend, and I emphasize this word, solely on God. We can't depend on our charm, our education, our degrees, our money, our status, our talents, our skills. We must depend solely on God if we are going to do something significant for him. There's nothing in Jonathan that indicated that he was depending upon himself. He was a great warrior, no doubt about it. But uh, he was not depending on himself. I wonder how many of us have never seen the movie The Sound of Music. Anybody here never seen the, the <laughs> Yeah, we've all seen the, the movie The Sound of Music. Remember that, that, that song that Maria Julie Andrews sings as she's tasked to go to the mansion of the Von Trapp home? She starts, the song says, I have confidence. That's the name of it. It says, what will this day be like? I wonder, what will my future be? I wonder, it could be so exciting to be out in the world to be free. My heart should be wildly rejoicing. Aren't you glad I'm not singing this, by the way? Oh, what the, to- uh, what, what, what the matter, oh, what's the matter with me? I'm always longed, I've always longed for adventure to do the thing I've never dared Now here I'm facing a venture. Then why am I so scared? A captain with seven children, what's so fearsome about that? Oh, I must stop these doubts, all these worries. If I don't, I just know I'll turn back. I must dream of the things I am seeking. I am seeking the courage I lack, the courage to serve them with reliance. Face my mistakes without defiance. Show them I'm worthy, and while I show them, I'll show me. So let them bring, bring on all their problems. I'll do better than my best. I have confidence. They'll put me for the test, but I'll make them see I have confidence in me. Somehow I will impress them. I will be firm but kind, and all those children, heaven's bla- heaven bless them. They will look up to me and mind me. With each step I am more certain. Everything will turn out fine. I have confidence. The world can all be mine. They'll have to agree I have confidence in me. I have confidence in sunshine. I have confidence in rain. I have confidence that spring will come again. Besides what you see, I have confidence in me. And it goes on and on and on. The whole point is, I have confidence in me. And that's what the world tells us today. You can do it. In fact, one of the things that the world does, and I I say this is so contrary to what the world, Word of God, is the world. The world says, find something that you can succeed in, excel in, and and if and and, and, and you and do that, and and that, and, and find your self esteem in that. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't do whatever you feel God has called you to do. Where I'm not saying you shouldn't do it well. You should, but that doesn't determine determine who you are. What determines who you are is who God says and who Christ says you are. And so this, the way the wired is this thing, and then when I have people in counseling, I have to constantly walk them through this and say, look, this is not, you're, you're trying to determine who you are on the basis of, of the, the, the distorted mirrors that you see every day in your life that tell you that you're not up to par. You see, you have to have your... F- Trust in him. Go with me to another passage, Psalm, one more, Psalm 33. Let's hear what the, um, what the psalmist has to say, beginning in verse 16. The king is not saved by a mighty army. A warrior is not delivered, beginning in verse 16. A warrior is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a false hope for victory, nor does it deliver anyone by its great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope for his loving kindness. Now, let me just, let me take this for just a moment and help you see this. See, he says, those who hope in his loving kindness. When we understand who we are in Christ, we understand his loving kindness. That's his mirror of us. 
He says, but the eye of the Lord is on those who find their hope in who they are in Christ. Can I, can I make that point? To deliver their soul from death, to keep them alive in famine. Hmm. Our soul waits for the Lord. He, he is our help and our shield. For our heart rejoices in him because we trust in his holy name. And watch the last verse. Let your loving kindness, O Lord, be upon us according as we have hoped in you. Here's what happens to a lot of Christians, including pastors. We get complimented about our giftedness, our ability, our talent, and then we begin to, to believe our press slippings. Instead of saying, listen, um, and, and by the way, it's okay to say God has gifted me, God has given me talents, but as long as we're willing to say, but I know that without God, Nothing, I can't, I can't accomplish anything without God and without his power in my life. I'll fall flat on my face. Uh, my father-in-law had the gift of giving. He had a very uh, fruitful business that he, he, he owned and ran and, um, and, and he gave thousands of dollars to the church, to missionaries. And I, and I remember when I went to talk to him about can I take, have his daughter's hand in marriage? After we got past that part, we talked for a good while. And I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, God has blessed me immensely. And he says, but I have no misgivings. God has blessed me to give. To give. When I was, uh, when, when Deb's mother died, she was the last one to die of the two. I was made executor of the, of the um, state. And so I, I often wondered, what did he make? You know, this was in the 80s. And I guessed, I told Dave, I bet he makes so-and-so. I missed it by 100,000. Huh. He said, I'm blessed to give. We, we need to keep that mentality. You know, uh, eagles, we know them to soar, don't we? And we know that they soar based upon the updraft and the, the wind gust. Did you know that they can't really flap their wings as much as other birds do? You know why? Because our wings are so large and so heavy. If they were to flap their wings like other birds, they would just they poop out, fall to the ground. They, need, they depend upon the, wing, on, on the gust of the wind or the updrafts. And occasionally they'll go, and then they'll soar some more. There are many believers who are kind of fighting through life, trying to get through it, and, 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 they're, and they're frustrated instead of waiting on God and allowing God to help them to soar. We talked about this a few weeks ago. We must depend solely upon God. We must say, this is the reason I exist, nothing else. This is the reason I'm, I'm in this place. This is the reason I'm a carpenter. This is the reason I'm an engineer. This is the reason I'm a draftsman. I, I can go on and on. A salesman, a banker, et cetera, et cetera. I'm here, and, I, and, and God has given me great fruit not because of me. Now, real, real quickly, let's get back and finish the text here. Back in chapter 14, beginning in verse 9, it says, If they say to us, wait until we come to you, then we will stand in our place and not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, now this is Jonathan speaking, then we will go up, for the Lord has given them into our hands, and this shall be the sign to us. When both of them revealed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines, the Philistines said, Behold, Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hidden themselves. So the men of the garrison held Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us and we will tell you something. And Jonathan said to the armor bearer, Now watch this, Come up after me, for the Lord has given them into the hands of Israel. He didn't say into the, my hands, but into the hands of Israel. 
Then Jonathan climbed up on his hands and feet with his armor bearer behind him, and they fell before Jonathan. And his armor bearer put some to death as well. In the first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within a half a furrow in an acre of land. Now, what is a half furrow? Well, it was, uh, let me give you the, what the scholars say, Hebrew scholars say, uh, in one uh, lexicon, it's referred to as a plowing ground. Uh, a furrow was a whole, was a, basically a trench or a channel that would be plowed, and so it would be a whole plowing ground. So you say half is half of a plowing ground. Uh, the scholar went on to say this gives the rendering as if it were a half, a plowing stent, a, a yoke of ground. Uh, so those, those last two phrases really kind of give each other the definition of what he's talking about here. I, I like the contemporary English. I, uh, let me back up here. Uh, there's some obscurity here in, in understanding what an acre is and also understanding what a half furrow is. But the point here is that it was a, a short size of ground. Uh, the, I like, the, as I was about to say, the, the contemporary English version, which I kind of like, says it's about 100 feet and yet they killed 20 men. Now, uh, they may be like an American ninja, I don't know, but uh, I think that God was with them all the way there, don't you? Uh, they, and, 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 and then what happens later, is, I won't, we don't have time, but there's an, God right after that sent an earthquake and confused everybody, and they begin to, <laughs> they begin to kind of kill each other, you know. That was God in it, God was in it. And so what you see here in verse 12, he says, God is going to give us this. And you go back to verse 6, and he says, if perhaps God gives us the victory. Here's what I want you to get out of this. I must humbly leave the results to God. When I seek to do something great for God, I must leave the results to God, everything to God, not try to dictate to God what I think the results should be. That's our problem with, with, when we depend upon God. Uh, or when we look to God to do something, we say, I know it, he's going to do this, I'm going to claim it, I, I've claimed it, I, now I, he's, he's going to do that. Uh, Dr. Charles Feinberg, you've heard me mention him a number of times at Talbot Seminary. He was, a, again, the leading Old Testament scholar alive. In, in one of our classes, Dr. Feinberg, he's a completed Jew, uh, trusted Christ uh, right before he became a rabbi. He was going to be a rabbi and trusted Christ. Uh, but he would always close our classes by saying, see you tomorrow, Lord willing. And I used to think, and he'd say that, and then he'd say that about a lot of other things, and I used to think, it's kind of redundant. Uh, prof, I didn't say that in his face, wouldn't dare say that in his face, but I, I thought that was redundant. But as I thought about it more, I really think Dr. Feinberg was such a godly man that he believed that. He believed, Lord willing, everything he did was contingent upon whether it was the Lord's will for his life, whether he was there or not. Um, by the way, just a footnote to this, so I know some of you really like John MacArthur. Uh, John MacArthur graduated from Talbot, and, and Dr. Feinberg was the dean there. In the story of Among Us, all, uh, what we all kind of debated who would be his favorite student or best student that would do his funeral. Josh McDowell, John MacArthur. John MacArthur did his funeral. I went to, Debbie and I went to a seminar. I, well, I, I need to wrap this up, so let me, let me get to the, very tempting here, but I need to wrap. So what do we, Jerry, can we put those back up? The three, is that possible? Okay. So I must, divinely, must have a divinely inspired courage. I must depend solely on God. I must humbly leave the results to God. That's what, if you're gonna accomplish something for God. So here are two applications. Number one, expect God to work. When you do those things, expect God to work. Don't say, well, I hope he works. As long as you expect him to work his way. William Carey said, expect great things for God, attempt great things for God. Number two, learn to release the outcome of every endeavor to God's will. Learn to release the outcome of every endeavor to God's will. Let's pray. Now, for everyone who's listening either online or here in person, let me just say that 
Everything I'm talking about today will not make any sense unless you know Christ as your Savior. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, all you need to know is that he went to die on the cross for each of us for our sins. I'm a sinner. Everyone has sinned. We've missed God's mark. That's what that word means. And thus we need a Savior, one a perfect sacrifice who's willing to die for our sins. Why did he have to die is because sin is such a uh, stench in the nostrils of God that someone had to pay the price for that. And so Christ paid that price. And so if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, you're watching online, you can do it right there in your home here in this auditorium. You can just right there where you are. You can say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for my sins. I, I receive you now as my Savior. I recognize that I need a Savior. And I thank you for coming into my life. You don't have to turn over a new leaf to live a better life. The Spirit of God will help you do that. You don't have to join a church. You don't have to become a better person. That won't get you to heaven anyway. The Spirit of God wants to come and work into your life, and he'll make you a better person. But that's not the, that's not the issue right now. The issue is Christ. What will you do with him, the resurrected Lord? Father, thank you again for your word, the power of your word in our lives, Lord. Help us to have a heart to serve you, to do great things for you. Lord, some of us are, really, are tired, and we do a lot of things. And, Lord, we need others to step forward, to come forward and say, hey, I need to be involved in this church. I need to step forward and uh, help others and, and, and seek to do great things for God. And so, Lord, I pray that each one of us will leave here today with a great freedom to know that uh, you want to use us. And so we just need to make the proper adjustments to do that, Lord, to be used of you. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. We will remember. We will remember. Thank you for coming today. God bless you. You're dismissed.